there, this is Wafal Abedat. You're listening to the Women Power Podcast, a subsidiary platform to the Women Power Summit, the largest event in MENA, with the aim of empowering women and helping them achieve their absolute highest potential. Each week on the Women Power Podcast, you will hear honest, vulnerable, authentic, real conversations from inspiring women. These women will share their experiences and stories into what it takes to build a successful business and career. The podcast will share insight and inspiration and hopefully inspire action and lead change. Zahra Lari is an Emirati figure skater and the first figure skater from the United Arab Emirates to compete internationally. She's a five-time Emirati national champion and also the first figure skater to compete in hijab. Welcome, Zahra. Zahra, congratulations. You just got engaged. Or did you get married? Yeah, the wedding will be in like a month. Are you having a Corona-style wedding with limited guests? Limited yeah, of guests. course. And I feel like you're in love with your husband. I could be wrong, but it's the vibe I'm getting from the photos. And like, I feel it's not arranged. Was your relationship arranged or how did you guys meet? Well, I knew his sister. So that's how I met him is through his sister. But he's not related to me or anything like that. It's just that I know his sister and then I got to meet him. And then, I don't know, we just clicked. So yeah, so is that how it felt for you as well when you guys met? Yeah, it was the same. Like when I saw him, like I don't know how to explain it. It's like a, just like a special connection that just happens. And it's really hard to explain to others. But it was, you can say, just an automatic special bond. And uh, yeah, so I was really lucky to be able to find someone like him because he's absolutely amazing. It's just crazy. I feel like relationships generally are weird because, y- you know, sometimes you meet the right person on paper, like tick, 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 but then there's no chemistry. And then sometimes you meet somebody and you're like, I feel like this is meant to happen. And it sounds so cheesy, but it's re- it's true. Yeah, it's so true. I mean, it's two diff- completely different people that are connecting together. So you can't really expect the other person to be like tick, tick, tick and everything like exactly how you want it. But it actually turns out to be even better than what you expect also. And if any problems happen, you also know that you're going to be there for each other and you, you'll just get through it and that's completely fine. Even if I do something wrong, he'll forgive me super fast. If he does something wrong, he also forgives me super fast. So I'm just super happy to have him and he's beyond my expectations. I can tell anyway. I don't know where I've seen you like with him, whether it's a photo, but you just your face like I've seen you look at your mother and father with love. Like, but when you look at your husband, you're completely so it is very gooey and it's very awesome. And I'm so glad you found it. I also feel your whole family is generally so harmonious. Like, I feel like you have the calmest, most supportive parents. Flawless is what I see the reality or actually, you know, what we see is one thing and what's behind the scenes is something else. No, I mean, my parents are super supportive. So what you see on social media, whether it's with my parents or myself or like anyone around me, it's all genuine. I would never post something that is not me or not how my parents are. But I mean, we're not like a super perfect. Of course, sometimes my mom yells at me and stuff like that. That's completely normal. And I do not post that on social media. But I mean, they're very supportive and it wasn't always an easy journey let's say but you can say at the moment they're super supportive and also my brothers are super supportive of me as well and it became like a huge family sport and it's kind of crazy how it all turned out to be but uh, they're exactly how you see them online and how you see me online is exactly the same and uh, I'm always happy online I mean of course I'm not gonna lie sometimes I don't I'm not happy sometimes I'm sad or sometimes I'm upset or sometimes I'm angry but majority of the time I am happy and I'm I'm just a happy person I'm just super positive and I always try to be that way you are I've seen the interview with you and Enes Baha she was trying to crack you and that was a painful interview I just there was one question where he's why do you always smile so much and then you're stopped smiling but you still kept saying you're positive it was just you can't crack me like I'm just you know there isn't like a hidden situation like I'm this is me that was a pretty interesting interview. Yeah, it was. I think it, even he was saying like afterwards, it was probably one of his toughest interviews because he was trying to get something and there was just nothing because exactly what you see is exactly what you have because I don't hide anything. And like, I'm just a happy person. Even during practices, I'm always smiling. I'm always laughing. And I can only remember literally three times during my whole career that I was actually crying during training. And that's the only thing I remember. And, and usually athletes cry a lot during practices because you're exhausted. But 
but I mean, I'm just always trying to be positive and happy and it's not worth, honestly. You talked about the three times that you cried during practice. Can you share with us an experience about what triggered you to kind of... Well, one was really recent. So <laughs> that's the one I really remember, like exactly what triggered it. The other ones, I think it was just... I can't really remember exactly what triggered it, but the nearest one was actually, you could say maybe like a month and a half ago or two months ago. It's during quarantine, during COVID. So as you know, in Dubai, everything is open, but in Abu Dhabi, it's still closed and our facility is also closed, but it will be opening very soon. But so I had to go to train in Dubai for, um, I was there, I think like 10 days to practice there. So I went to Dubai and I was just training and training and training. And I think it was almost like the last day or the day before last. And I was just so tired because, I mean, during COVID, we all got used to the lazy part and we're all just like chilling and we're not used to working hard anymore. And so it was just really hard for me to get back on track. And it was just like a moment that I just had to realize that it's okay not to be perfect. I mean, I haven't been skating for almost six months now, and that's the longest break I've ever taken. So it's okay that my jumps are not how they were before it will just take a bit of time to get them all back and that was the reason why I think I broke down it was just the whole let's say COVID situation it was everything that was like going like everything was like overlapping each other and at the end I was just like and then I tried to I don't really like crying during practice and I was just it took me a while I got off the ice I got five minutes to myself realized it's completely normal went back on the ice and just kept training again. What is the hardest part about training? Because you do the same thing every single day. And like I used to do, I used to train for, for Ironman for a triathlon. So I used to bike, swim and run. However, every time we would bike or swim, even though Bahrain is like the small and we do the same routes, I'm still outdoors. The weather is different. Uh, every single time I go out, uh, we try different running routes. So my schedule varies. So I'm in different neighborhoods and different streets with sometimes different groups of people. With what you're yeah. doing, there is this consistent, you know, like the ice skating rings are limited. You possibly go to like a certain amount of gyms. So it's a lot of the same environment. What is hard about doing the same thing in the same environment every single day? I think that's what makes a sport also really tough because in order to be great at the sport, you just have to repeat and repeat and repeat. And then like, for example, for 12 years, you're almost going to be doing the same jumps, but you're going to be adding rotation. So you start with single, then you do double, then you do triple. And everyone asked me, how do you keep doing it? Like what motivates you to keep doing the same thing over and over again for 12, 13 years so far? And for me, it's always like, Yes, for example, for I keep repeating the same thing. And then let's say for two months, three months, I'm just falling and falling and falling and just repeating and falling at a certain jump. And then just like one day it just clicks and you get the jump and you land it. And that is the best feeling you can ever get as an athlete because you work so hard on something. And then once you finally get it, it's like, okay, what's next? What's next? And then you just like, that's what really thrives me. That's what makes me want to keep continue, like want to keep going and want to keep trading is those moments because it, like those moments are worth all those falls. It's like a million of falls and it's worth all of it. The tears, the sweat, the blood, everything that's worth it. So really like that's what motivates me and that's what really keeps me going. You sound so Japanese. So you know the Japanese, like I don't know if you saw this movie called <laughs> Jiro Dreams of Sushi. Did you watch that movie or a documentary? Oh. Okay, you're going to have to watch it. It's basically about like the best sushi chef in Japan. And yeah. to do the sushi, like you have to like boil the rice for like 10 years and then wrap it in like something you know for 10 years and then pick yeah. the right fish for like so by the time you're older you're a master because you do the same thing over and over again every single day no breaks no holidays like it's just so consistent so um i think it requires a japanese amount of patience to be able to do that and did you grow up in a household where your parents were calm and patient and focused was that around you because I feel like you need a strong foundation to be able to repeat and do this stuff over and over again to become good at it I mean my parents are super calm they're never forcing me like my mom is the one that used to take me to the rink all the time so I got my driver's license but she's very calm she's not like you see a lot of for example especially in skating and like gymnastics and these type of sports you see a lot of let's say moms that are they're the ones that are living their dreams through their kids 
And my mom is not like that. Like, she's not the type that would yell at me. She's not the type that would tell me, like, no, you have to go to practice or you have to do this or do this. And um, no, she was like, I'm just here to support you. If you want to continue, continue. If you want to stop, stop. It's up to you. And uh, it all came from me, to be honest. Like, I just really love this sport. And I, I found myself just really disciplined because I just really wanted to be successful in it. Like, for example, in our house, you always find donuts, brownies, cakes on a table. Like, they're always there. And it would just, it had to be from me that I know that I cannot eat those things. It's not like forceful. No, you can't eat that. You're on a diet. It has to be from me. And I think that's where it all came from. I mean, my parents are calm and they're just supportive, but it all really came from me. I was, I'm a very disciplined person. So if I want something, I'll just work super hard and I won't let anything else distract me just to get to my goals. Do you feel like by choosing to be a figure skater that you were rebelling not really because at the at the time I was just a child and I didn't even know like anything I was just a kid and I really wanted to skate and my dad took me to the ice rink and I was just skating for fun once once a week and it was just for fun and nothing ever crossed my mind I was just doing it and then I started to get better and then I started competing and it was just literally until 2012 when I went to Italy where the points got deducted and I was just the media went crazy That was the only point where in my life, that was a changing point where I was like, wow, I just did something that is not normal. Because before that, nothing ever crossed my mind. Even when I went to Italy, during the competition, during the practices, I never saw myself, oh, I'm so different. I'm doing something that is, wow, something that is different. It never crossed my mind until after the competition was done. Uh, Then it was like the media explosion. And that's when I was like, oh, I just basically made history and I was the first one to do so and yes after that we got some negative media attention yeah after that we got a lot of positive media attention but before that never even crossed my mind it's not even one second that I was doing something different or that I was the first one doing the sport while wearing the hijab or anything like that I was just really focused on just doing what I love to do and I think that also I think made me successful in the sport I think because it's really me just doing what I love to do. It's I'm just having fun with it. I'm going along with it. And it's nothing is forceful. Um, I just love it. So I think that also played a huge role into my success. I love the story about how your dad supported you, like his transitional point from going to like, you know, you can't compete to I'm going to get behind you. Can you share that story with us? So I think it was like, almost I don't remember exact age, but I would say maybe around 15 16 something around that age my dad was maybe 14 something like that he was okay you're older now you can do it as a sport as a hobby but I think it's enough with competition you're a girl now you're growing up and you're not a kid anymore and basically how the society will think about about it you doing the sport and okay like it's enough you're older and you know like typical talk that they usually give you so during that time I mean he is my father so I was really quiet about it, but then my mom was, I didn't know even half of what was happening because it was behind me. I didn't know, they they weren't doing it in front of me, but now I found out that my mom was really like arguing with him and pushing him because she, he was, she was telling him that I'm really, really great at the sport. I'm very talented and there's nothing wrong with it. And it was going back and forth, back and forth. There was a competition in Dubai and I couldn't participate in it. So I just went there for fun and then um, just to cheer out my friends and that's when my dad uh, said he saw me just sitting and watching and like not like I was cheering, but I wasn't happy because I wanted to be on the ice. And that's when I think it just like clicked in his head that it's OK. Like, why am I not letting my daughter compete? Like, what is wrong with it? There's nothing wrong with it. And that's when literally he sat me next to him and he said, from today, you're going to go to competitions and you're going to train hard and you're going to do what you love to do. And literally from then, it was just like, a, I think it was just like a click in his head. And since then, he supported me like a million percent. He's like my biggest supporter. Is He opened up a club because then he brought in coaches from outside so I can train here in UAE and have the best coaches. And it's been at the beginning, it was a roller coaster. But to see how he changed his mind about it and how he's supporting me right now, it's it's really nice. It was It's a nice journey. I wouldn't change anything about it because, I mean, even the struggles, it made me who I am today. It made me a strong person and I'm um, just really grateful for both of my parents. Does he like it when you share the story? 
I don't really know. He doesn't like, he doesn't really like to be in the media. He doesn't like to be in, in anything. He, he's just like a backstage, um, part. He doesn't like when I talk about him. He doesn't like anything. He's like, I just support you because you're my daughter and I love you and I see how much you love it. But I don't need to be in the media. I don't need to be in the tension. He doesn't really want to be. He's just like there to support me. But I don't know. I don't really know if he likes it or not. Maybe he doesn't so much because maybe now if he thinks about it, it makes him sad that he, he, disagreed with it i think it's important to share the story it's such a cool story because i think the story of your dad is a, probably the story of a lot of dads but not everybody transitions into the other side and gets behind their kids it doesn't matter if they're girls or boys have you had anybody come up to you that's a girl to say like i look up to you and my dad doesn't let me or my dad won't you know support me or my parents don't support me what should i do Um, Because you were able to get both your parents behind you and then you won your parents over. So what is your advice to these girls when they come to you and they're so vulnerable? Yeah, of course, I get some face to face. I get a lot on social media. Uh, People send me messages. And to me, my advice is always just teach them, just show them. It won't get you anywhere if you're just fighting with them or, or being rebellious or anything. It's the opposite. Just sit down calmly explain to them show them if they're not accepting you can show them other athletes that are doing it and to show them that it's okay and I think like especially when we look at our parents they've lived in a in a society that was completely different than how it is today I mean we can like it's expected for them to act how they're acting or the opinions that they're giving us it's very expected because that's how they lived it was not okay for for women to do sports so I think it's the opposite. I always tell them, just try to educate them, show them that the country is supporting females, show them the different entities, show them the different athletes that we have here that are doing sports. And I think that way, then slowly, slowly they'll click and then they'll accept it. But if you just go as a fight mode and just fighting and just screaming and not reaching anywhere, I always tell them that will not work. It's the opposite. They'll just get even more angry. So just like sit down, have a serious conversation and just I think that would be the best way. So I love your advice. It's like gentle power because mine is the opposite. Mine is like stand up to yourself, (laughs) do whatever you want anyways, and they'll come around. (laughs) Even if it means you don't have to talk to your parents for a while. Like my advice is so aggressive because I feel like that's what I had to do to like do what I want (laughs) um, in my life. But I love your version because it's gentler. It has a lot more empathy and it doesn't have to do with ego. It has to do with just sharing a story or showing facts and information so I really really think that's some good advice I want to talk about your training again just you wake up at 4 30 in the morning every day so for somebody that used to wake up to go cycle at 4 a.m to put in a 90 kilometer uh, bike ride before the sun comes up at 7 or 8 how does your body feel going from like really warm you know getting up and then go and just getting in the car like you know does your body still hurt you or have you now have you kind of gotten used to the routine now so it's like normal well i'm gonna take it to the different phases because as i grew older it was completely different so when i was younger let's say when i was in grade from grade 10 until a senior i was actually waking up at 3 30 and going to the rink i had to be at the rink at 4 30 and train and that was a bit easier because i was younger and it wasn't so difficult actually and then once I got to university, it was really hard. Like, it was very difficult. So then I had to switch it to 4.30. So I wake up at 4.30, and I was at the rink by usually by 5.15, 5.20 to warm up. And it never got easy. Like, they say, no, you'll get used to it. That's a lie. You don't get used to it. Like, no matter how long you do it, you don't get used to it. And, like, your body is just really tired. I always say in the morning... It's okay if I don't give it my all because it's still, the sun is not even out yet. It's okay. So I always know it will just be 50%. It will never reach above that. It will only be 50% in the morning. And then my later practices can be 100%. But then once I graduated university, and then I'm so happy to say this, I don't go early mornings anymore. I just do like, uh, because I have more time. So my trainings have been like, for example, I'd go like at eight o'clock or nine o'clock in the morning because I have a lot more free time and I can really focus on my training. And then I would have several sessions throughout the day and it is much easier. But at the time, I didn't have the time. I mean, I was going to school or university and I really like when I was in university, I would be at the rink at 530 train, go back to university after university, come back to the rink and then from the rink, go back to university. So I was literally just driving back and forth between the rink and university. 
So um, it was really challenging. Get, well, the cold, like some mornings are really cold, but your body kind of does get used to it, actually. And especially you have to warm up off the ice before you get on the ice and your body gets used to it. Like some people would be like, it's freezing, but for me, it's actually really hot. And so I think your body does get used to that aspect of the cold part. But the waking up early and having to train and give it your all, no, you don't get used to it. For the third year in a row, we are excited to host a completely new experience of the Women Power Summit. Our new event, the Women Digital Festival, is happening on November 15th and 16th. It'll be our first ever digital conference with over 10,000 women and more than 100 speakers in attendance. Our events will be jam-packed full of digital conversations, panels, workshops, and mentor sessions. This stay-at-home digital summit is fantastic for small biz owners, entrepreneurs, creators, and young professionals. It'll be all about building, growing, and pivoting in the new normal. Some of the topics we cover will be about money, wellness, working from home, and feature fantastic stories by leading women. Tickets are only $53 and will give you access to our online networking platform where you can exchange business cards with fellow delegates and have access to a digital gift bag full of goodies and to our virtual expo. Sign up in the link in the bio of our Instagram account. Don't miss out. See you there. So we know that you spend a lot of time on the ice, but do you do any strength workouts, Pilates, yoga, things that kind of complement your ice skating work as well? My schedules, I would say the different things that I do change throughout the years, depending on the coaches that I had and what they thought would be best for me to do. I've tried Pilates before, but at the moment, majority of my time would be on the ice. So let's say if you have five, six hours on the ice, and then you'd have like two hours of gym. So I would do like one hour of, um, let's say you would do strength and conditioning or your jumps you have to do your jumps off ice cardio any of that stuff and then let's say the other hour would be ballet stretching choreography something that is lighter and easier to end your day with so for off ice i would just do like strength and conditioning jumps those type of things and just flexibility ballet you mentioned three types of workouts so strength and some cardio ballet choreography and then there's ice skating works which one is the worst and which one is the best Well, I think the worst for me is just the flexibility class. I don't like that one at all because it's just painful and you see kids are screaming and crying and it is just painful because they really have to sit on you and press you and it's not um, a very nice (laughs) session, let's say. Um, I would say that and also uh, strength and conditioning as well, like I don't know, like, yes, I am strong, but at the same time, like, my maximum push-ups I can do is, like, 10 to 20, like, I'm not that strong, so I don't really like it, I'd rather just have it all on the ice, to be honest. How do you recover physically? It really depends on my mood, like, some days I just want to stay in bed and not get up, for example, and some days I want to go to the beach or the pool, or sometimes, for example, I have to go do physio if I'm in a lot of pain or if I have an injury, so... I think it really depends. And also, sometimes during my day at off, I have to do a lot of media work and interviews. And um, so it's actually still work. So, I mean, it really, I think, depends on just my schedule. If I have any interviews, if I have any photo shoots or anything like that. And if I don't have any of that, then if it's an actual rest day, sometimes I just want to be super lazy and not do anything. And sometimes I have to go and try to recover either by the pool, beach or physio. Do you do any like meditation? No, I never tried meditation, but I don't know. I cannot do that. Like I went to one session, um, if you know Manal, so we were together for the one of the Nike sessions and they had like a meditation session and her, like me and her were just laughing the whole time. And I just could not stay still. I cannot do it at all. I just start laughing and I'm just like messing up everyone else's mood. So I decided to just, no, I'm not going to do that. Can you tell me how it feels like when you have a competition and you're about to get into the ice rink and it's like really quiet and everybody's watching you and the world is watching you and whatever happens is going to be, you know, kind of portrayed back home. How does it feel for you? Do you feel pressure or are you like, it's just me and the ice? Like what goes in your mind in those moments? 
Oh gosh, it's super stressful. <laughs> it's a super, super stressful moment because if you think about it, it's not like a team sport. You don't have anyone else on the eyes. It's just you and all the eyes are just on you. And um, like you worked so hard all those years, all those months, hours, whatever it is that you put into it. And at the end, it all just comes down to this point. So it is a lot of pressure. And sometimes I don't know why. Sometimes I can handle the pressure and sometimes I cannot handle the pressure. And I still can't figure out why it is. I just need to understand my body more. And I think it like, I don't know, sometimes also the vibes of the ring, the vibes of the people around, it does affect as well. And for example, like uh, one of the competitions that I went to in Russia, it was for the Winter University Island. It was a huge competition because it was the first time UAE was presented there. And the media were literally chasing me around the rink. Like it was, you'd see me running with my coach and you'd see 20, 30 media people just running after me. And it's like, I have to practice. Like I was late to my practice session because they were chasing me. I was, they were like literally everywhere. So I think in that environment, I did not do well at all during the competition. I think it's just because I couldn't really focus and it was a lot of pressure. Just, I was very distracted, but I would say that was like the fault was not on them. It was on me because I was just maybe I need to be able to focus more. No matter what happens around me, I just need to be able to focus. And uh, it's a learning experience. Um, every competition, you just learn from your mistakes. And um, I think that's the main thing is how to keep going forward. Like, okay, you made this mistake, but how do I not repeat the same mistake again? And you just keep going forward. You always learn something new. And um, I think the people around actually help a lot. Like, they're super supportive. Every country I go to, they're extremely supportive. They always want to take pictures. They always are telling me to keep going and not stopping. So, I mean, the people, they're always super supportive. But I just need to really be able to focus and uh, not get distracted. I don't want to say you're PR, like media trained, because I do feel you're very natural with the press. And I've seen you do multiple interviews and you approach each it feels to me like you approach each interview as if it's the first interview like it doesn't feel like you're tired of it or you know tired of sharing the same stories or you're bored you're actually like authentically like happy to be there and happy to share your story and you're grateful for the opportunity as well so my question is what is your relationship like with the press how do you look at PR and because you are also readily available you're very accessible which is amazing because not everybody's organized in that way not everybody's bothered people get sick of it at some point but it feels to me like you're really diligent and you're very professional so where did this foundation come to you to you know to kind of prepare you for this for all this attention I think it's just with the years I actually just gained more experience with it because like um, at the beginning, it was super difficult because I was only like 16 when or 17 when all the media attention came on me. And it was very difficult for me to be able to handle that because there was always people at the ring taking videos. There was always people constantly trying to take videos, watching or into attending a training session. But I think we were able to control all of that. Like my coaches at some point said, okay, no, people are not allowed to come in during your practices. People are not allowed to take pictures or videos or anything like that while I'm in training. And we don't, we have like media only set on certain, for example, certain days, certain times. And I think that also helps because I do have like um, a management agency and they're also helping me a lot with that. I think the most important thing is that you don't feel overwhelmed with everything. So it's not like constantly 24 seven, you're just doing, you're surrounded by the media. I think it's, the most important thing that it's very controlled and it's not just like every single day or it, it has to be controlled and you have to have a certain like team around you that do help you with that because you as a person you're super busy you focus on your training and all these other stuff and you don't have time to actually focus on that so I would actually say let's say through my parents through the team around me through my management agency I was able to do that and they also I had to take some courses on how to talk how for example, sometimes they would ask me a question that I really did not want to answer, but it would be rude to say, sorry, I don't want to answer, like how to get around all those things. So it took years of experience, but I think I started it very young. So. You know, I love that you said, you know, I did some courses, I needed to be diplomatic and figure out how to like not upset people, but also be comfortable with answering questions. What is the worst yeah. question that a reporter has asked you? I wouldn't say like an, a certain interview, I would say behind the scenes, I had some horrible stuff happen behind 
behind the scenes. Like I had one interview where the reporter came in wearing a white jacket and then she came to me and I was wearing my official uh, national team white jacket. And she told me, no, I'm wearing a white shirt. You have to go to the, ne- the store next by and buy another, get you another jacket. And I said, I'm sorry, can you go? Because it's my official jacket. I cannot go and buy a shirt. I'm sorry. So that was one thing. And for example, another thing, like let's say sometimes if you have, let's say you're already training four hours and then you have a photo shoot on ice that was supposed to be only two hours and then it runs to six hours. I've been in tears before because of that, because you're just exhausted. And But I mean, through the through the years, my mom has been super tough and also my manager has been super tough and telling them that's it, you have this much time and that is it, you cannot go exceed that time. And But I mean, I don't think someone ever asked me like like a rude question. I've had like super weird question. I went to one in one media, um, like an interview TV thing, and it was the weirdest thing ever because I'm an athlete and the whole hour show was about carpets. And they're asking me, what is my favorite carpet? And I was just sitting there and I was like, I really know nothing about carpets. So <laughs> it was a really bad one. <laughs> That's the weirdest story I've ever heard. It's a carpet show with Zara Lari. Yeah, and then afterwards, my mom and I were just looking, literally like 10 minutes just staring at each other. And we're like, what was that? And I was like, I don't know. But I just went along. Where is this interview? Is this online? Or is this like, was it aired on TV and it disappeared? I, I didn't bother watching it afterwards. I was like, no, I'm probably not going to watch it. <laughs> that's the highlight of my interview oh that's really funny i have to tell you that i did not see that one coming at all that's so funny when you started um ice skating you were the only you were the first of everything and now there's over 100 women in the uae skating how does that make you feel it makes me feel super proud and that all the struggles that came along are, are worth it a million percent because i mean i am the first the first always gets the punches and the holds and the pushes and everything else but then that is only so that the next generation will take it will have it much easier like they don't have to worry about getting deductions they don't have to worry about finding oh where should I train what club should I train with what coaches should I train it's everything is literally provided if any MRT go to if you go to Abu Dhabi if you go to Dubai it's, it is provided so it makes it super worth it and it just makes me proud that the sport will continue like once I stop the sport won't die the sport will continue it will keep going and that was my main goal my main concern even at the beginning it's like okay I'm doing all of this and once I stop because there will come a day where I stop once I stop will it just all go for nothing and uh, it just made me super happy that you know like it will continue and I think it just makes me feel super proud When you were younger and you used to go to all that training, did you ever get FOMO that you would miss out on events, birthdays, parties, just like doing the normal stuff that teenagers would do? I missed out on a lot, literally, because I mean, especially my senior year, kind of my graduation, I would say. But I mean, a lot of things I couldn't attend because I had practice and it was always like I had practice at practice. But I had the best friends ever when I was in school because they were always super supportive. They never told me, but why? Why do you have to go to the rink? Why do you have to go to practice? It was the opposite. They would say, "Okay, what is your schedule? Okay, let's plan it once you're done instead. And they were super supportive. So I got to hang out with my friends sometimes on my day off or sometimes even after practices or in between practices or anything like that. But I mean, I did miss out on a lot. My birthdays were always spent at a competition. They were never home. It was always at a competition. So, but at the same time, I mean, I was never really sad about it because I chose this path. I chose this sport. I chose it. No one ever forced me. I chose it because I wanted to do it. And like, once I stop, I'll have a lifetime to do anything I want to do. So um, at the moment, I just need to focus on what I chose. Did you ever lose any friends along the way? Because they were like, this is too much. Your high maintenance, this is like, you're always busy and there's no give and take. And I quit this relationship and they, they kind of broke up with you. Yeah, of course. I mean, there were so many friendships that were lost throughout the years. and But that just shows you who, like, the ones that really support you and stick with you no matter what happens are the ones that really do care about you. And they're the ones that should stay in your life. The other ones should not stay in your life because they don't really care about about you or the successes they should it's the opposite they should be very proud they should be super happy that you're doing all these opportunities all these different things and so the friends that are supportive or the friends that stayed those that are let's say cause drama and I don't need extra drama in my life so the ones that did cause drama they're the ones let's say that didn't stay <laughs> but 
I mean, it's just life. It's always like that. I mean, friends come and go, but the ones that really do care about you, the ones that are like truly your friends are the ones that will stick with you no matter what. So I feel like part of the ice skating experience is also the dress code. You know, you watch a lot of this stuff or a lot of these competitions and the women are in sequins and they're in glitter and they're in silver and red and it's just so um, magical. And tell me about your experience designing your outfits. What is your process? And who do you collaborate with? I mean, the costumes, you, ha- you do have to custom make them. But I think all high-level athletes in the sport of figure skating will customize your costume. And the process is actually one of the best processes in the sport is picking your music, then you do the choreography, and then the last thing you'll do your costumes. And it's the whole thing is just a story. The colors, the design is all a story. And you just have to make sure it goes with your choreography. Even my choreography is always made so that it's not like over the top it also has to go along with what I believe in and like everything it goes back to who I am as Zahra Lari and I don't want to copy no that skate those skaters are doing that so I should do that and it's not like that I'm just sticking to my my culture my beliefs and just going around like everything will go around that and I wouldn't change any any of that and I found like great choreographers that also did my programs that they also understand that they know like for example some movements I shouldn't be doing okay because I am a Muslim girl like some things I don't really want to be doing so everything is going around that and also my costumes and like everything is all has to be as like one unit everything has to come in all together like even comes down to the smallest thing the makeup the everything because the sport of figure skating is it's sad but it's all about looks like I mean, yes, talent comes there, but also looks pay, like plays a huge role in the sport and how you look, how you present yourself also plays a huge role in your scores and, and your success in the sport itself. Uh, so all those also matter and they take a lot of time to do. It's not like a very easy thing. We at Obayan Hill have over a decade's worth of experience working with some of the world's most successful brands across F&B, retail, culture and hospitality. We are equally at home helping a brand define its point of view, positioning a new development, designing product, packaging or creating content that speaks to an audience. Whatever the challenge, we deliver sharp, intelligent content driven work that helps brands amplify their message to customers around the world. Contact us on www.obayanhill.com or DMing us on Instagram for your public relations, social media and branding needs. Where do you go to to feel inspired, to build a whole story around? Well, the first thing I have to just, I actually just find music that I really love. And once I find the music I really love and then we just have to build a story behind this. So you sit actually with your coach or the choreographer and just come up with a story. This season, I'm, I collaborated with Ahab Darwish and he's an Imarati composer and he came up with a story and I, he told me about it and he composed the whole music and he actually called it Zahra and the whole story behind it is my story. So it's an easy uh, choreography because it's just my story. It's literally the journey, the whole thing is just the journey throughout the journey of when I started skating until how I am today. And and that's my current uh, program. So I would say it's not just me that comes up with it. It's a lot of different people around me also that contribute to it and will give me ideas. And it's like just like a huge brainstorming session and everyone just puts in their ideas. They pitch in and until the end, we come out with this product. At this stage in your career, is your full time job skating and are you making a living out of it yeah at the moment it is my full-time job so I don't have a job out of it it's just like it's just me skating um and also the different collaborations and stuff that I do that's how I make the money at the moment and yeah I mean I think it's it's actually one of the best jobs you can do I mean you're doing something you love and at the same time you're making money out of it I think life is great your revenue source is partnerships and collaborations with brands I've seen some of your collaborations with Nike and other incredible platforms. How does it feel to be collaborating with these, you know, with these amazing brands, but also the content that they produce with you is 
so inspiring. Like it's just, it, it's all in line with your values. Yeah, I wanted to ask specifically about the Nike experience and maybe the Red Bull experience as well. Like for me, whenever I choose a brand to collaborate with, I mean, I get a lot of different brands that want to collaborate, but I don't just automatically say yes. Or for example, they pitch in a number or amount or a certain number of dirhams or money into it. I don't just automatically say yes, I'm going to do it. It's not like that. Everything has to go around my beliefs and it has to go along to what I believe in and what I I really want to portray also as myself. And and I think that's for me that is the main thing. Well, once I do choose a certain a certain uh, company, it's not just yes, this company is offering a certain amount of money and are you going to do it or you're not going to do it? It's not like that. I just have to actually research the company, see what they're what they've been doing, see everything because at the end of the day, it's my name also will be attached to them. So I don't accept everyone. I do I'm very picky when it comes to that. And also um my manager at Bukhash Brothers also knows that, but I'm very picky about it. But I think it's it's super important because that way you're true to yourself, you're true to your audience as well. It's not like I'm I'm showing you guys a product that I myself won't be using or if I myself don't like. I'm not that type of person at all. So everything that I do put on my social media, any collaborations that I do, any sponsorships that I have are always companies that I really support or um, I believe in them and I use on my daily basis. Can you tell me about your best collaboration and what that what made that so special for you? I mean, I've had so many amazing collaborations, but I would say Nike was just insane because as a kid, even before my collaboration with Nike, as a kid, I've always worn Nike. I was always obsessed with Nike. And when they contacted me wanting a collab, like wanting to actually sponsor me and me being an ambassador, I was like, what me? And until today, I can't, I, I can't believe it because it's like one of the biggest brands like in the whole world. And they wanted me and I'm like, well, why me? Like I didn't do anything to be on Nike. So I think that was for me, it was a huge accomplishment. And um, I'm extremely proud, honestly, to be an ambassador for Nike. And they're really trying to really um, support women and support even Muslim women. They came out with a Nike Pro hijab. All their clothes are trying to make them even modest clothes for them. And they're really uh, sticking to what they believe. They don't really, I mean, once the Nike Pro hijab came out, they didn't think, oh my gosh, what will people say? Or will there be negativity? Will there be? No, they said, this is what the market needs. Muslim women need something to cover and be able to work out. And they just came up with it. So I think that's why I really love the brand. And um, for me, that would be my biggest accomplishment, I would say, when it comes to collaborations or brands. There is a documentary called Ice Princess. It's highlighting your journey and Disney's influence, which is currently in pre-production, which is, I mean, this sounds super exciting. Can you tell me anything about that experience? Um, Yeah, it was just, it was an idea. So when I was in the US, I met with the writer of Ice Princess. It's where I started skating is through the movie Ice Princess. So I met the writer and she was super nice. And we just came up with the idea. Why don't we do another one? It's still, I wouldn't say anything about it because it's, we don't know much about it yet. It's, it was just an idea. And um, hopefully if everything goes through and everything works out, then everyone will be able to know more about it. But at the moment, we still don't have much about. Well, it sounds really cool. I always feel the best ideas start from conversations. And that's awesome that you were able to track down the writer of the very film that inspired you i'm sure you were fangirling the the writer which is so interesting what was it like not qualifying for the winter olympics in south korea and are you excited or gearing up for the next one not qualifying was i mean of course i'm not gonna say it was fine i was upset about it but just being there was also a great accomplishment because no one from the ue ever went to the winter qualification so for me that already was a big accomplishment and I just went there and showed that someone from the UAE can be in a winter sport and can be in a winter qualification, Olympic qualification. And for me, that was already an accomplishment. Um, once I, I like once I didn't qualify, it was, it's a very stiff competition. It's not easy at all. Only top six. There was maybe 40 skaters, only top six qualified. So so not qualifying. Of course, I was upset about it, but it was just like, OK, OK, it's fine. Let's see next. If I'll be able to go to the next one or if I'll work hard to try to qualify for the next one. What is like the age limit for people in your sport? I think the age limit is just when your body is cannot do it anymore. (laughs) There is no age limit. Like if you go back a few years, it was like 25, 26. 
but now you see some in their 30s still going. So I think it just depends on your body, if your body can handle it or not, and uh, whether you're still passionate about it or not. There isn't a particular age on it for it. And what's your plan B? So let's say you retire or, you know, at some point or another, you're like, you know what, my body can't perform like it used to. I mean, as we get older, I feel like that's something that we have to also kind of grapple with. Hopefully you, will, you can do it for a long time. But I mean, if that day comes, what is your plan B? I mean, I've ha- I have a lot of uh, projects in my mind and things that exciting things that will be coming there are things that I cannot talk about unfortunately but there's a lot of exciting things I would say coming and a lot of things that are planned for the future to come I mean you're not I'm not going to disappear don't worry even once I stop the sport I'm still going to be out there I think I'm just going to expand to different areas try to grow in different areas and you just have to wait and see how it goes out what is one thing you can share about Like maybe one of my goals is to write a book or maybe it's to do another. Yeah, one of my goals is to write a book. So that is the one thing that I can say is like, yeah, my goal is to write a book and um, just how my life is, some things that people don't know about, just like behind the scenes of things that people don't hear about or don't or don't usually see. I think that would be a lot more interesting. Um, People know my journey, but this book will have a lot of let's say, things that people don't really know about. Would you ever want to try a different sport? That sport specifically, there's no age limit. You can always compete and train. You know, there are competi- like you can be 70, 80 plus and still be competing and win your age group. Is that something that you would want to transition to? Or is there like a different sport? You know, I've always wanted to... Rafael Nadal always says, if it wasn't tennis, it would have been football. So is there like something that you're like, oh, I would have loved to try that or transition to? I wouldn't say I would do something competitive. Because it is very difficult to do any competitive sport. And I don't want to do anything. I don't want to enter a sport, competitive sport, and not do well in it. I'm a perfectionist, so I want to do good. I would say, like, just a different sport for fun. Like, my husband right now, he's a swimmer. So, for me, he's teaching me how to be a good swimmer. So, this is another fun thing. You said earlier on that your father started a whole club to support you and to get you the right, to get you coaches and to also provide coaches to other people is this like a yeah. full functioning business that he's created yeah. for you or it, did he see a business opportunity and run with that at the beginning he made it literally it was just for me to be able to train and practice so he opened up it's called emirates skating club and it's the first actually official club here in the uae so it's where the national team majority of the national team athletes are training at and Um, but at the beginning, he did it just for me, and it was just me to train. And then now it's grown into this huge uh, club that has a national team that holds different country national teams. So we have the Thailand national team skaters. We have different national team skaters from all over the world training with us. We have coaches coming in from the best places in the world for the sport. So I think it grew to a place where we didn't expect it. It's grown big. Of course, with COVID, things have been difficult um, for every business, I would say. But I mean, he did it to start just for me. But then afterwards, um, we realized that it will help the community a lot. It would really help the community because we have some skaters that just want to do it for fun. So we host a competition every year that is just a fun competition for them just to wear costumes and be characters and go on night and for the public to come and see because It's really also important for the public to watch the sport and be able to watch it and just have fun and learn about it. And I think also that is another goal that we're trying to do is just to get the community also involved in it. And it's not only for serious athletes. It's also for those that want to do it just for fun. You said a couple of times in the interview that you've been through so many hardships, even before you know, you got recognized by the press and you got all this media. Can you tell us what some of those hardships were? It feels like it's something that you also experienced with your family. Well, I would say the main one would be just my dad at the beginning not accepting it. And then after that, it would be before that, before I went into the press, it was mainly that, um, to be honest, it was mainly just the, the like my dad's decisions and stuff like that. But then once I entered the media, it was also like the media and some negative media coming in and my mom was super worried about it. And and then following that, it was just like once it got more intense, I had to have more hours and we didn't have enough time in the facility that I'm training and not enough ice time. Hockey was taking majority of the time. And then also it came to a point where I couldn't, uh, there was no sponsorships and I couldn't pay for my training. I mean, there are so many, I would say, journeys, a lot of a lot of things 
But the most important thing is that I overcame those difficulties, those barriers, and just to show the world that there's always going to be um, obstacles, but don't look at them as mountains. They're just small obstacles and you can just over them and just, you know. When you said the media, we got some negative media. What yeah. is the worst thing you've read about yourself in an article that really like upset you or hurt you? To be honest, I don't read anything about me. I never research myself like at all. My mom does, so she is upset, not me. Yeah, but at the very beginning, there were some really bad comments, like some horrible comments. And my mom was just really scared. Like she was actually like super scared. And I think no matter what, she told me actually stop the sport. She was like, that's it, you're stopping, you're not doing it. But then I was telling her it's fine. And my dad was trying to explain to her. It was not until the leaders of, of UAE, actually, like one of Sheikha Fatma bin Tazah, she sat with my mom and she explained to her that the country is supporting me and don't look at the negative parts and just focus on your daughter. Don't look on social media. And I think that's when uh, my mom felt relaxed that the country is supporting me and uh, nothing bad will happen to me. It's okay. But that's really cool because I think leadership from our countries really validate and give our parents the kind of security they need and the confidence they need that we're doing it's like a higher authority almost I'm done Zahra but I wanted to thank you Zahra this was so lovely you're as lovely in person as I thought you would be this was such a positive positive energy interview I hope that when women listen to this they feel like they could make a living out of doing what they love to do and you honestly my biggest takeaway is how you apply gentle power to just find a way to get your way. That's it for this week. Thank you for listening to an episode of the Women Power Podcast. And thank you for downloading and streaming our podcast every week. If you love what you've heard, tag us on Instagram and follow the Women Power Podcast and Women Power Summit account for more information on our next episode. Please leave a rating review wherever you get your podcast. It really helps other women discover the show. That's it for me. See you next week.